Well, welcome, everybody. You know what time it is, so cheers. Ah, it's director's commentary time, in case you misread the title. How about we just get right into it? This is, uh, I believe, the second or last time that I went out with Todd Stanning to shoot a Bigfoot film. More on him and that situation in a minute. Here we go. Let's just kick it off. Love this opening. Such a beautiful opening. It's going to turn down, but I'm going to leave it running. Uh, this opening, I worked with, uh, well, my editors uh, uh, worked on it, but uh, as far as the actual footage, but those were graphic holes left by the graphic designer, a guy named Mike Stanley. He just, he's really the best there is. And this opening of his, it's just beautiful. It's all his idea. Everything just like, wow, you killed it, dude. Radium Springs, unbelievably beautiful. This is British Columbia. Ooh, there's that voice. Stunning landscape in Western Canada. Since the first days of exploration, the stories of a big hairy ape living here have endured. Uh, what am I looking for? Disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer. Uh, it's a director's commentary. Yes, I'm going to talk a lot. Get over it. You wanna watch the film without me talking? Uh, go over to the other playlist. It says Survivor Man Bigfoot. It's there right now. You can watch the whole episode. In fact, maybe you should go do that. Go watch the whole episode, then come back and watch this maybe on another night. Here we go. They're not considered a myth by the local residents. Lots of jokes can be made about the Loch Ness Monster, unicorns, and even Ogopogo. When you film in a place like about the Western Canada in the mountains, so why do I seek answers about Sasquatch? You can't lose. Why not just stick to survive? It's so beautiful. I have no claim of seeing anything. So why research a myth? Well, all myths are rooted in some kind of meaning. I'm not a Bigfoot researcher. I'm not even really a Sasquatch enthusiast. I'm just an outdoor adventurer, a survival instructor, and I've had my own experiences that have left me with questions. And can you get that through your head? So many of you that just really wanted me to stay doing what? Building shelters constantly? Want to see me build another shelter? Start another fire with the fire bow? Or, or a different method of fire starting? I love doing that. Absolutely adore it. And I've done it so many times for so many episodes. Uh, but this was an offshoot. And, uh, man, just let me have my fun, would you? And I want to try and get the answers to those questions. But along the way, I've been asked a lot of questions now. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why don't you have cameras up on the apples? Why don't you have other cameras buried? Why don't you use this scent or that? All right, well, that's what I'm doing. It's going for broke. It's, as I call it, the shotgun approach. Let's put everything out there and see what we get. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I forgot about it. See, I, I'm watching this episode. I haven't seen it in so long that it's going to be like, oh, yeah, I forgot I did this. And I think, I think this is the episode where, technologically speaking, we put a ton of stuff out. So I could really get into that question right now. Let's watch it a bit more, and then I'll, I'll get into why the technology, why not the technology, when it comes to trying to prove or disprove the legend of Sasquatch. The skeptics and the advocates alike must be willing to look at whatever evidence exists without blinders on. They must be willing to accept, if found to be indisputable, certain pieces of evidence as fact. Of course, it's just what those facts are that matter. So ruling out human hoaxing and wildlife is imperative. The problem for Bigfoot advocates is that there is yet to be indisputable evidence. There is yet to be found a smoking gun. The problem for the skeptic is that the eyewitness accounts are increasing every year. It's going to take forensic study to uncover the truth. That's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? For the enthusiast, they don't have that smoking gun. And for the skeptic, there's so much anecdotal reference, including before this became famous, that it becomes hard to refute it all as widespread delusion. Widespread panic, good band. Uh, so 
were left in this dilemma, caught in the middle. And that's all I do. That's all I was doing, really, uh, is saying, okay, let's, let's just run that middle line between I need some proof and I hear what you're saying about your experience because right in the middle there is a crazy place to be. What I really want to try this time is sort of going for broke. And so I'm going to start by putting a camera right in here and have it pointing out. All right, let's get started. I, I remember, you know, doing all this. That's really nothing but a lens. It doesn't make any sound. That's the beauty of it. But it also doesn't record anything. It's got to be tethered to a, a recording unit. And I've got to bury that because it uh, See? And stop. So this is one of those... Uh, Things within doing a documentary series, like when you when you film a documentary series, no matter what the subject matter is, you want to really dig deep into that subject matter and hit these incredible points. But along the way, sometimes it takes some just a bit of inertia. It takes takes a bit to get going. And if you have uh, a device, if you will, like say, okay, on this one we're going to explore all the technology, it can be a little nervy because, well, what? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? But before you know it, you've got a pile of things you can do. And when you start dealing with cameras, you can get into all the technology. I'm not a techie guys, a techie guy, guys. I have never have been a techie guy. Uh, when I do music, I love working with recording engineers. I don't want, I don't want to work Pro Tools and the Logic Audio. Don't like it. Uh, and when I'm a filmmaker, you know, I, I love to point the lens and make sure it's, it's lit well and beautifully focused and all that. But the technology behind a lot of the camera stuff, I don't geek out on it. I'm, I'm more about the results. And so when you have all of this techie stuff, you can have a lot of fun with it, work with a lot of people, but you know you're going to get story results no matter what because the story is the process of trying to get to the cool shit. Eliminating all sounds and lights on hidden cameras will go a long way towards achieving a successful stealth approach. That hatchet there, that's actually a Les Stroud designed Camillus hatchet. Um, actually, was, that one was more designed by Rick, the guy who worked with at Camillus. And it's, um, it's funky looking, but it's, it's not a wooden hatchet. It's, it's, uh, it's too, too, I don't know what it is, awkward maybe. Uh, it works well, but it's a little awkward on the hands too. Uh, as you can tell, I don't really do much with Camillus. Well, I don't do anything with Camillus anymore. Um, yeah, I should stop right there. Leave that subject matter alone. Okay, so this is real simple. It's set on motion detect, so it will not record unless something moves in front of it. And it can record at night in the dark. It'll switch to infrared light on its own with because it's got little sensors. What I want to do is just bury this whole thing. That's why I've got the plastic container. And hopefully, if it has a light or it makes a sound, well, that won't be seen by anything. That's the point. And I'll leave that little lens up there in the stump pointing this way. The idea being that a Sasquatch comes from the outer bush because he smells all the stuff going on down there with everything that we're setting up and walks right past his camera. It's a long shot, but it's worth it. Now, let's stir it up a little bit here. And I'm going to put, I've got to put something odd, something different, unique that wouldn't normally be up there. So I have pure beaver caster scent. This stuff stinks. I'm going to put it in front of my first camera. Let's put the scent. So this was an area that, uh, oh, I've got a phone call. I'll get right back to you. OK, I'm back. And actually, it's two days later. So that phone call went on for a long time. And then I had to go down to Toronto after that because I'm actually the, uh, the host of a new podcast called uh, uh, Deadly Disasters. And we did a six-part series. There's apparently another hundred to do. But uh, we're starting with the six-part series where I host, uh, I just simply narrate. Uh, this uh, podcast about the deadliest disasters of, uh, in history sort of thing. Really interesting stuff. Anyway, that's what I went to Toronto for. And now I am back here and ready to resume where I left off when that oh-so-rude phone call came in. So let's put you there. There you go. And uh, wardrobe change. 
I'm in my PJs. But most importantly, drink change. I was enjoying a lovely, I can't remember if it was a Barolo or a Cote de but now, do, 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 oh yeah. Shall we resume? I believe we shall. Ah. Okay. Let's see. Where were you last? I think you were somewhere right here. Pure beaver caster scent. This stuff stinks. Okay, so how do I make sure my editor can hear all this? Uh, hopefully he can. All right, I'm right, here we go. I'm at 523. Of course, that doesn't help you, Luke. Never mind. You can figure it out. You're good at that. And I'm gonna put it in front of my first camera. <sighs> Have you ever scent. smelled right beaver so caster long. scent? Oh, oh it stinks. I always remember the scene from Jeremiah Johnson. Okay, let's put a little bit of this stuff here. Anything living here will be used to the smells. So the idea is to change things up a bit and promote some curiosity. Right, yeah. <laughs> so that's a thing. Got it all over my fingers. <laughs> that you'll hear uh, Bigfoot researchers talk about all the time is, is that, oh, well, they all disagree, I suppose, at some point. But in any event, uh, if such a species is out there, you know, it, it follows that they may be, with their intelligence, quite curious. And so if you create a disturbance out in the forest, it's something that may make them curious to come in and check out. You've got to remember, this was during a time where my own experience with the subject matter was still growing, and the concept of putting out all kinds of technical uh, bits of equipment to try to capture said species on camera seemed like a very realistic concept. My opinion's changed since then, but let's keep watching. All right, so that should stink up the place a bit. Let's see if it gets any reaction for me. Bigfoot filmmaker Doug Heichek and I discussed this confuse and conquer idea where I'll set up nearly 30 different stations, including pheromone chips, audio recorders, various cameras, shotgun approach, food as bait, DNA collection traps. But will all of this be enough to capture an image of something reported to be the most elusive being on the planet? So here's the thought. Pheromone chip as some sort of strange and crazy attractant. The apple as a kind of offering or bait. Musical instrument just because, just you never know. Maybe someone will play with it, who knows? I have no idea. Down below, oh, I look chubby I've got there. the audio recorder buried in the ground. And then one step below that, I've got a DNA trap. This is really about confusion here. One thing I've avoided here is using an IR camera, a camera with an infrared light. So there's no constant beam or anything like that. And I don't know, will the, will the Apple actually bring something in with a pheromone chip drive something crazy when it gets here whatever it might be be it deer or elk or bear will it knock the musical instruments i don't the musical instrument i don't know but i've got recording device catching whatever sound is going to happen here but no camera however i've got a dna trap just set below here so if anything is going to happen to step on that area i'll get some dna ah the elusive dna did you know that uh if you research it enough you'll find that the concept of capturing Sasquatch DNA uh, has been, well, not the concept, but just actually doing it has been going on for a long time. There, it, it, research some of the stuff that uh, Jeff Meldrum might speak about. I mean, there's a lot of stories of people gathering DNA uh, and even getting it, actually David Politis is, is really good with this, and even getting uh, information back, you know, where they say, hey, uh, some university does a blind test on it and says, you know, this, this seems to be, you know, 95%, you know, some sort of ape species or hominid uh, and 5% something else kind of thing. So, so that's not going to happen if it's DNA that's been gathered that comes from a bear or a moose or something like that. And so where are these studies? Why, why doesn't anybody take it seriously? Well, why doesn't anybody take the whole darn subject matter seriously? This is the thing, is that 
well, I could go on and on for this one. H have there been Sasquatch that have been killed? Apparently, yes, and more than one, a number. Have there been Sasquatch, has there been DNA gathered and tested and come back as we don't know what it is kind of answer? Quite a few times, actually. I mentioned guy, uh, uh, the name of Doug Hycheck in there. So Doug was one of the first uh, in this field uh, when it comes to filmmaking about the subject matter. So he, did, uh, he was responsible for Monster Quest. Really nice guy. Great. I, I thought Monster Quest was actually really well done. Now, I, I, when I say for its time, I don't mean that in an insulting way. Uh, it's just that at that time, what was necessary, he did, and he did really well. Uh, we've gone on from them with new technology and so on. And I will never forget the story that Doug told me when we started uh, going on this. I said, well, what got you into it in the first place? Why, why are you so into this? And he told me this story, and Doug, forgive me if I get it wrong, but I'll just, it's so I'm paraphrasing the whole story, but he told me this story where he had gone up to, I believe it was Quebec, northern Quebec, it was, I believe it was a fly-in fishing trip, and they landed in this remote spot in the middle of northern Quebec. Uh, so it's not like he went to, you know, Topanga Canyon or Yosemite or some park where there might be hoaxers about kind of thing. No, he's in the middle of northern Quebec, Canada. And for, for all you Americans, that's a long way north. It's basically subarctic. Uh, and he uh, landed, goes out on the beach, and up there, you got to understand, there are beaches that go on for miles up there. Oh, they're beautiful. I've walked them myself. I've followed caribou tracks. Doug didn't follow caribou tracks. He found massive, as in, you know, the 19 to 22 inch range, human footprints with a gait that, that spanned, you know, six, seven feet in distance between steps. And he followed it for what I believe was one to two miles. Those tracks just walked along the beach. And at some point, he said he was following and following, and then he got the most disturbing, hair on the back of the neck, creepy feeling that he could ever imagine. And it was like everything in his body said, turn around now, don't keep going. And, and he did, and that's what spurred him on to begin exploring and doing, as I said, some great film work, uh, well worth watching Monster Quest, um, uh, on the subject matter. So Doug, there you go, hopefully I got the story right, uh, and uh, still very proud of knowing you, and still, uh, still very uh, happy to say you did some of the best work there was. Uh, so, okay, well, I'll leave that, and I'm gonna press play again here, but before I do that, I think I'm going to run up and get my uh, Bluetooth speaker so my editor, Luke, can hear this so he can cut this all together. But right now, he's going to cut it right now, and then, and then when he uncuts it, I'll be sitting right here again, but this time with a Bluetooth speaker. Ready, Luke? Cut and uncut. Wasn't that just magical? Got the Bluetooth speaker. Let's put on some better sound. And by the way, speaking of sound, if you are hearing strange kind of sound out here right now is because there's a thunderstorm going on all around me. So you're hearing rain and you probably hear some thunder as well. Okay, let me see. But what's it going to there take we go. to convince anyone? There you go, Luke. DNA from an unknown primate species has already been gathered in Washington state and largely ignored. See, I didn't lie. Yeah, that's what we're ignored. Perhaps a combination of gathered evidence can be scrutinized scientifically. So for this station, I've done quite a number of things. Got the apple, pheromone chip, and this time I've set up a camera. Hopefully, if something does get excited over either the apple or the pheromone chip, the camera will catch it this time. There's an absence of proven consistent methods, so I'm setting each station up a little different from the last. A camera here, an audio recorder there, with bait and without bait. Something's got to work. Each time, what I really want to do is just get a little bit closer to something authentic, something that just might work. At the very least, if it brings in a wolf or a fox or a grizzly, then I know it's working. And this is one of those times where I'm taking the next step. Let's see how he likes this little guy.
Perfect. Call that my grouse cam. Look at this guy here. Now, I've still got to bury the recorder. If it is just an ape, albeit an intelligent one, then sooner or later, we should be able to outwit it. Unless, of course, it's smarter than us. All right, so the significance of this particular setup is that I've got the grouse up there with a camera set, all ready to go. The wire runs all the way down the hill, and the recorder's down there. But look at this. Look at this. See that behind me? That was one of the first Sasquatch structures that I was ever shown. Ooh, getting into the Sasquatch, Sasquatch structure. Got all about that. Um, so, but I'll interrupt right now, go on the, uh, the technology side of this. It's, as I said, I'm just kind of throwing everything at the wall at this point, right? And uh, I said something there. I said, if it is a, an ape, you know, we should be able to capture footage, that sort of thing. I will jump ahead of this whole game and say, the truth to me is, if all it was or is, is an ape, really, really, really smart ape, and that's what I think certain researchers, uh, rest in peace, uh, John, Binder Gable, John Bindernagel thinks, I think uh, Jeff Meldrum, uh, who believes very strongly as Giganopithecus. Uh, I think we'd have one in a zoo. Absolutely. There'd be a few stuffed around the world too. So we have to give it more than that. And that's why in many ways, I think all of this technology is a bit of folly because uh, uh, I don't think there's anything that's that intelligent and that well adapted to the wilderness is going to be fooled by a stuffed grouse with a camera in its chest. That's what I think now, but you never know. So I basically just violated their main area. Let's see how they like that. Maybe they'll take it all out on the grouse. Isn't that interesting? I forgot I said that. So I said violated their main area. Lots of stories in history of, well, there's a, a cabin here in Ontario. I'm in Ontario, Canada right now. and. Um, that has been destroyed. It's become famous, and of course the owner, I, as far as I've, I've heard, is that the owner that charges you like 10,000 bucks if you wanna go visit this cabin kind of thing. I don't know, I could be wrong about that, but I've heard that. Uh, so, but the, you know, they've done everything they can, and I guess rocks have been thrown at it while people have stayed there, and, and then it gets destroyed, but not by a bear kind of thing, so. I guess if this species is, exists and is in, nature. Well, look at it this way. There's all kinds of humans, aren't there? So if there are, roughly speaking, are somewhere between 30 and 130,000 of these things hiding out in nature responsible for all of this anecdotal reverence, they're going to have different personalities, aren't they? And that's where I think we get the different stories from uh, past indigenous cultures, First Nations, and that, is some of them are quite friendly and helpful even with communication and others are, are uh, not, maybe not necessarily malevolent, but uh, dangerous. And there have been, you know, killings and kidnappings kind of thing. If you're watching this right now and you got this far, then you're probably into it, so I don't need to say this. But if you're watching it and you're like, I think this is all a bunch of crap, well, you should probably stop watching actually. But uh, just for your sake, just understand that a lot of these things I reference and talk about, we're not talking about one or two things here. We're talking about thousands of anecdotal, tens of thousands of anecdotal references by hundreds of cultures and, and tens of thousands of people, okay? So get over it. It's, we're not talking about the boogeyman or one thing or Santa Claus. We're talking about something that as a phenomenon is widespread and also around the world. So I don't know why I felt like saying that right now, but I did. So here we go. Let's keep watching. <laughs> whose music that is. It's, vital for me. it's either Peter or Ian. Evidence in the area that I can, even if I think I already know what it is or isn't. And casting tracks is a big part of Sasquatch researchers' methodology. All this is here is hairspray. Helps to lock things in place there. Hydrocal is an inexpensive and easy substance to work with for casting tracks. I'm actually going to uh, be doing a um, a full instructional piece on how to properly cast tracks. Uh, I don't really do it here. It's not that difficult, but there are tricks to it. In fact, I have a friend of mine who is a, a potter who's uh, really good at it as well. And he has some tricks that, that only a, an artist can really know. So I'm going to be doing an instructional piece on how to cast tracks in the wild. Uh, 
on the hopes that one day you may have a big ass human footprint or human like footprint somewhere way out in the wilderness that's not a hoax. All right, let's keep going here. For a few hours, we're good to go. But are they Sasquatch tracks? It's too easy to make mistakes and even easier to make wishful assumptions. Just washing off these casted bear tracks to get a better look at them. They really are massive. Oh, look at that. That's hey. huge. There's my hand. Hang on. Yeah. Huh. You know what I just realized? I don't have that track anymore. I wonder where that went. Because I, I was looking for it, I have this one. So this is Grizzly Bear. Check that out. So, and I think I casted this at the same spot. In fact, I can see it in behind on the sand, this track. So I still have them. But I don't know where that little one went. That's really disappointing. Huh. Nobody stole it. But what's this one here? Oh, just purported to be an actual Bigfoot track. How about that, eh? This is a famous one uh, that uh, I received from uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Look at the size of that. I know. If you're not into this, you're going, that's just fake. Maybe it is. But what if it isn't? That's a grizzly bear track. Now this one here is the one that's really important to me. Now watch this. Look at that. Now doesn't that look like a Bigfoot track? The reason being is that what has happened here is the bear walks in his own tracks and it can create a bit of an optical illusion and look like a Bigfoot track. You see, here's where he stepped once, but then he followed it by stepping again here, put them all together, and look at that. But if that got that messed, like a Bigfoot track? if that got messed up by rain, way, that people can be fooled by tracks when they see them. And they say, no, it was huge. It was, you know, what's that? 14, 15 inches long. And it ends up looking like that. So, and, and if it gets muddy or something else steps in it and smudges it or rain, uh, anything like that and smudges it and it could shape it into a track that you think is a massive uh, human track because of the bear's morphology. But uh, that, is much different than that. See what I'm saying? One, two, three. It's part of my job to push the Bigfoot enthusiasts and researchers out of their own comfort zones. For years, most of them have sat on what they believe and claim to be real evidence and proof of the existence of Bigfoot. And though I enter their areas of research with respect for their methods, I bring with me my own set of challenges to their notions. Todd Stanning, considered to be one of the most controversial researchers in the field of study, has no issue with accepting any challenge I throw at him. Ooh, it's a Todd Stanning. I didn't. I wasn't sure if he was in this one or not. Oh yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna talk about him, wasn't I? Let's watch it a little bit, and then I. And then I will. Including returning to places of terror. Todd and I are just heading out into the bush here to spend some time in an area that Todd is no stranger to. It's a spot where he had one of his most significant and horrifying experiences, heading out to the rock where he was surrounded by Sasquatch. And all he had really was a little camera and some flares. And he has been back there. And here we go. Get it! Ha! Get it! Ha! Get out of here! Get! So this is Todd's original footage. And 
that one's right here, right here by this. So that footage, interesting. I, I don't, I'm not sure if uh, Todd <coughs> has put that out there or not. Um, uh, working with them, we we're able to use it for this series. Well, could it be fake? Of course it could be fake. Anything could be faked. I guess you have to come back to what is somebody willing to do to fake and hoax these situations? What's the motivation? You know, did, did uh, Roger Patterson have motivation to fake his famous film from, what was it? Was it 67? 67, I think. Uh, yeah, sure, because he was trying to make a film. He, he had motivation. Does Todd Stanning have motivation? Yeah, he'd like to be known as the, the Sasquatch guru guy. He's got motivation. But what drives someone to even get to that point if that is the situation? There has to be some kind of experience happening. I've had so many crazy experiences out there. That's why I just still find the phenomenon interesting and do these films. Uh, and now do these director's commentaries so we can talk, talk about it and go a little, go next level, talk a little bit further. But that particular stuff with Todd, I mean, you can hear the bleeping out of all the swearing. Uh, I have a hard time calling fake on that because I, I do hear a real true sense of desperation in his voice there. The constant swearing, for example. Uh, I think if he was faking it, he wouldn't, he wouldn't put in swearing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think if somebody was faking something like that, they'd be like, ah, yeah, get out of here. Yeah, yeah, which he did. But then there's a lot of like, you know, he's, he's swearing to himself a lot. We had to bleep it all out. Uh, and you can hear the fear in there, or it's just really good acting, right? Uh, he, uh, at the time, what he said there was that he was down to uh, a flare. He had a flare. It was his last flare, and that's what he's doing. He's waving around this flare. Uh, the growling, could that have been dubbed in? Of course it could have been. Uh, could it have been grizzly bears? Yes, it could have been. Um, so, I'm not sure what to do with it, to be honest with you. I know that so many of you get so upset when, when the Todd Standing thing comes in. I am not here to defend him. Not at all, okay? He may, I've said this before, he may very well have duped me. And if he did, good on him. Very few people can pull one over on me. But if he did, good on him. Uh, But, and I know people like to call him fraud standing and so on. The, the reality with him is that he's, in my opinion, a challenging individual to communicate with, to get along with. This bothers a lot of people. The last thing that anyone wants is for someone who's challenging to become cozy with, so to speak, to be right about something and to be in possession of some amazing footage. Nobody wants that. You know, I've said this before. Everybody's fearful that if you look at some of the clips he puts out there, if they're, if they're real, they blow away everything else. They truly do. So people, I think, want them to be fake. Why? Why wouldn't they want them to be real? Because then they meet him. They have their personality challenges of dealing with him, whatever they might be. And they say, no, no, he's got to be, he's got to be lying, right? So I'm someone who's been able to get along with most people and people who know me are like, yeah, right, Stroud. Just in terms of people I meet, new people, and in terms of if, if I, for example, if I meet somebody and they're an you know, egomaniacal narcissist asshole, but I need them for something, I know how to get along with them. Other people be like, I, I have no time for that person whatsoever. But I might need something from them. I might want to get into a certain area uh, if they happen to be Sasquatch researchers. Uh, believe me, it's a field full of freaks, honestly. Uh, and so if I meet a particular Sasquatch researcher and they're a freak and they're really difficult and, to speak with and hang out with, yeah, but you know what? If they're willing to just be open with me and get me into their area, I'm willing to be incredibly open with them and say, oh, just, just show me, man. I'm not here to judge. Uh, and that's the thing. Uh, whenever I go to that, so, well, that's a thing that I had to do with uh, a, a person such as Todd Stanning was not judge him. Uh, just say, hey, man, show me what you got. And that's how I ended up spending that time. And I, th I think many of you are like, Stroud, you just lost your credibility because of fraud standing. Well, screw you. You know what? The reality is, uh, what do you got for me? Oh, nothing? Well, he's got a lot. And even if he's lying, I don't care. I'm willing to go in and find out. And at the end of 
three extended journeys with him out there, I'm here to say that I can't say whether or not he's an absolute fraudulent liar or completely honest and telling the truth and just desperate to get the word out there. And I can say that because I've had a lot of time with him. You haven't. You're just looking at a clip, watching a few online speeches he might have given, maybe one of his films, and saying, I don't like that guy and his stuff's all fake. Well, you're making a judgment call knowing nothing. So there you go. There's my little thing on Todd. I'll say it again maybe in upcoming videos if I, when we have him again, when I do another one with him. But uh, I will say this. Uh, I cannot verify anything he has or anything he says. Uh, what I can say is that I also cannot disprove anything that he says or anything that he has. Uh, and I will, the only other point of defense I might make on his, for him is to say that uh, he's boots on the ground and you're not. He spends weeks out there, probably months, He's obsessed with the situation, obsessed with the phenomenon. Good on him. Uh, you're not. So who knows? Who knows in the end? Uh, so that film footage there, I don't know. If it's real, it's pretty freaking scary. If it's faked, though, well, I guess uh, he had time on his hands. I don't really know. Rock. And uh, since that night, Todd has not ever returned to this rock at night. This is it. This is the first time. And we're going to sit it out here for a number of hours and just uh, see what happens. And uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a full moon. At the time of Todd's encounter, he had an older version camera with a weak nightlight and the flare that was short-lived. This time, I don't want to make the same mistake. Now, if only Todd could have had a light like I do, it would have made a big difference for him. This infrared light that you're watching me with right now is just the onboard infrared with the camera. If I turn on the extra one, this is the mid-level, it's really bright, but look how far. All of a sudden, you can see behind me, there's Todd. You can see up in the bush. Now, if we bring into it this massive infrared light. I still have that. Let me show you how this looks. Here you are with Back the regular camera light. Right here. Here it is with the mid-level. And here it is with the spotlight. And all of that's infrared. What a difference. So you can't see it, it with your naked eye. It's important to understand that only the camera can see this imagery. To the human eye, it's still pitch black. So if you're gonna head out there, you know, Go out with the best equipment you can afford because you don't want to come back and say, I couldn't get the shot. That's just embarrassing. Now, it's argued in some circles that certain creatures, potentially the Sasquatch, can see the infrared lights. I mean, I can see these red lights right now that are making this. Um, Todd doesn't agree with that. He, he just feels that when they're off in the distance and you're, and you're shooting that infrared light, they cannot see it. And so the potential is there to get one caught on film because just like any biological being, they're out in the dark, they have their night vision, but infrared is something different altogether. Even though recently it's been proved that caribou can see ultraviolet light, but that's the other end of the spectrum. That's a different thing altogether. So we're gonna sit here for a few hours. I guess in some ways, hope we don't get the same reaction Todd got those years ago. Maybe something a little more gentle is what we got. You hear that? Stay tuned. No? Yes. Did you hear that? Yes. Yeah, that's what got me out of the prison. Not just the growl, but the throwing. Of the something, sounds like something was thrown. Yeah. Something small, nothing big. Another one. Yeah, I heard that too. <laughs> Definitely, that's something that's thrown. Huh. This is exactly how it started with me. So this is where I will stop someone like uh, Todd and say, so you see, he said, so we started to hearing, hearing something 
landing around us. Let's say like little pebbles kind of thing. Well, it could be acorns falling off a tree. I mean, it, there's so many things that it could be. Hang on, let me just move you in a bit. It looks like uh, this rain is making you fog up. How's that? Is that better? That's a little, little misty right there on the lens. I wonder what that's all about. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. It sounded like these little pebbles sort of thing landing around us, which could be twigs. It could be nothing. This is where I will criticize someone like a Todd Stanton because his reaction is something's being thrown at us. Okay, uh, no. Not, not yet. Not re Too soon to say... Now he said, oh no, I'm, I'm an expert, I know this. No, I want better proof than that. It is still, nothing's moving. If something big made a sound, we would hear it. If something small made a sound, we might miss it. We gave a hoop before we came in, given one hoop here. It could be stuff just falling off the trees, but already we've heard two little things up and behind me, on you know, this side of me. Sound like little, something, little things being thrown. That's what it sounds it like. That doesn't mean it is. It Sitting out in the dark. The nearby rapids drown out much of the sounds this night. Yeah, see, that's one of the problems. You can even hear it. The, the rapids are so loud. We weren't far from the, uh, the creek, so and it's just super loud in there. But this little tick, 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 landing beside us, uh, again, could be a caterpillar falling off the tree, for all I know. Was something small physically tossed in our direction? Or did a little toad jump on a dry leaf? Assumptions can be dangerously misleading. A few small things, perhaps twigs, fell from the trees close to where Todd and I waited in the bush last night. But that was all. However, I'm frustrated by Todd's reaction to the same event, or non-event, depending on how you look at it. His quote the next morning was that they threw rocks at us. To me, this is a gross misrepresentation of the reality. Normally, I'd shoot Todd or any other researcher down when I sense that bit of overzealousness, but I let this one go proceeded to head up to the top of the mountain by helicopter, spend the night in what Todd considers to be his greatest spot, a Sasquatch action. Yeah, so that's what happened. Uh, late, we went down and, and um, you know, this isn't a Survivor Man episode, so I'm not alone with all of this. It's got the crew in that. So we went down and talked to the crew. And while we were telling them what, you know, what, what happened, uh, and I said, I, if I remember correctly, I don't think I'll ever forget this. I said to, I think it was my buddy Max, cameraman Max Atwood, and I said, you know what? Uh, no, it sounded like they were, like little things were, were being tossed towards us, you know, or falling from the trees or something like that. No, that's not what I said. Here's what I said. I said, uh, we heard a couple of sounds, but it was nothing very significant. And that's when he interrupted me and said, said uh, well, I think it was pretty significant. They were throwing rocks at us. That's significant. And I just kind of, he said that to Max, and I just kind of let it go. So, okay, that's exactly as I said there. That's the kind of overzealousness that when you get involved with various Sasquatch researchers that you start to experience. And it's like, you know what, uh, I'll let you say it, and I'm not going to challenge you on it because I want to keep working with you. But, you know, it's kind of like, duly noted, you're exaggerating kind of thing. We'll continue. Oh, man. You know what, it's so... Sorry about the foggy lens here, but it's so humid right now that that's what's happening. So, whatever. Mostly we're watching the show, so, sorry. The true ruggedness of the mountains are winning the day. We can't find a single spot to land the helicopter. Yeah, can't even so to get up there. And, be. and climb. This is actually the fun part of it all, you know, when you just start going up onto the ATV and putting boots on the ground and hiking up. And 
I used to do that as a land surveyor a lot. follows me for a short distance. Outside of Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, I used to uh, go in by ATV and snowmobile and then finally boots and just to get up to do some uh, land survey points way up in the mountains. I love it. Or I choose to take a different route up the mountain than Todd's so that my experience of being alone in what is claimed to be prolific Bigfoot territory may be enhanced. And let's remember, Todd claims it to be prolific Bigfoot territory. So yeah, we split up. We're uh, far enough apart that we could probably hear each other whistle, but uh, can't see each other. <sighs> Guess I better bring you with me. There is no traveling fast in the wilderness, especially straight uphill. The best thing is to think like an animal, move slow, just lumber along, break off and keep a nice, even, slow pace. And that way, if you do need to get out of something fast later, you don't have to rely just on adrenaline. You can have adrenaline and some reserve strength. So I'm gonna go up this mountain a little bit at a time. Man, was it ever steep. Um, but I've done, I found that out too, even just working, continuing to work with uh, search and rescue operations uh, down in the southern U.S. Uh, you know, it's not about being tough. It's not about being strong and fast. It's about endurance and going step by step by step. And you do that, you can climb a mountain. Well, I, I was part of a crew that found a 70-year-old man uh, had been lost for 19 days, and that's how he ended up on the top of a mountainous area. Just a little step, a little step, just kept going. He was 70 years old and he just kept going. And that's the thing, if you go slow and gentle, you can go a very long ways. Wow. It's gonna be a long day. That shot is where I have to still climb up to. It's a Bigfoot. Simply point to a print in the ground and demand an answer. And that's reasonable. Skeptics say, show me the body. And that's also reasonable. Whatever it is, it's a fact. What it's a fact of is the unknown. And even in the name of science, we should at least be seeking an answer for it. And that'll take effort, including climbing mountains. This was a heck of a Farther climb. below, my cameras remain on and hidden, and who knows what image they'll capture. Whatever it is, it'll be evidence pointing to one conclusion or another. I'm prepared to spend a couple of nights on the top of this mountain including one alone, as an attempt to peek over to one side of the skeptical fence I normally sit upon. Well, I made it all the way to the top, to where we were last year, as the fire pit. Oh, yeah. In terms of pure survival. I forgot that uh, this was... I had been there before with Todd in filming another episode, up to the top, but we... Uh, and. Yeah, we stayed overnight and then we came back. And that's why I said, look, I want to go up there, but this time I want to stay there alone. And it's pretty, what it really, what it truthfully and factually is, is heavy grizzly territory. But uh, I wanted to stay there alone. And no, I did not have a gun with me. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I probably had bear spray. Well, uh, this was, uh, so this is the night of Todd going up there with me and then he'll leave later. But If I wanted to be, a, a sort of an elusive, secretive species existing up here. And let's say I caught salmon and ate elk, caught elk and ate elk, deer, small mammals, picked a lot of roots, ate pine needles and grasses and sedges and berries. This is the place to do it. No matter how much I lament the loss of prime, beautiful and pristine habitat, and I, and I do, the fact is, there's also a lot of incredibly beautiful places and vast reaching areas where anything could survive. And this is one of those places. You can't sit on the couch. At this location may be one of the most beautiful spots I've ever sat in my entire life. It was just incredible. It was the, the, there was a valley this way and a valley that way and I was sitting right at the, at the corner of it. It was, it was, uh, and there was no development. Only boots on the ground will make you realize just how big, beautiful, and vast the North American forests truly are. Up there is where 
Tide calls the Forbidden Zone. The area where he refused to go. Down here is his spot, up there is their spot, is what he said. But uh, he's agreed with me that this year we can push the envelope and push into that territory. And just know that something like that is an arbitrary decision to make. Todd just arbitrarily decided, oh, I'm going to leave you that area. And his belief system and connection to uh, this phenomenon is to say, hey, you know, uh, I'm going to leave you alone in that area. So it's, as I say, it's a kind of an arbitrary philosophical perspective to take. Um, someone else might think that's just silly. Someone else might think it's very respectful. I don't know. But I thought, well, uh, let's, let's break that barrier this time. So I'm not going to wait for him. I'll take a little hike up there now. A year ago, I went easy on Todd and his claims of Bigfoot activity. This time, I'm pushing the envelope. Yeah, I want proof. Boy, that's beautiful up there. Whew. Yep. So in this one, and Todd knew that this was more about leaving me alone to do my thing. I'm at the top of a mountain in British Columbia, where a year earlier, I heard something banging rocks together, only feet from where I slept. Okay, so I just heard the strangest sound. It was like um, someone taking a, a, a couple of rocks and just banging them together really fast. Could have been an animal easily. And then a, just like a sound of something substantial just in the bush, and we're talking about maybe 20 feet away from me. But either way, what I just heard of was loud, distinct. I don't know what time it is, but it's uh, pre-dawn. And I'm just gonna lie here and see what else happens. Yeah, so that's what happened before. This time, Todd will join me up here for a night. And tomorrow night, I'll stay alone. Sometimes I look back on this stuff and go, what the heck was I thinking? So he doesn't go past this lock. Huh? Got to cross the street sooner or later. This is the higher ground on the mountain that Todd had reserved for what he believes is a group of Sasquatch. He has refused to go here for fear of getting them angry or scaring them off. So my act, he believes, would be an act of defiance to them by crossing the arbitrary barrier he himself established. This time, Todd is good with my methods. He said, try anything. After all, he spent many years trying to convince the public of what he knows to be real, and it's not working. You know, and my, my thought is, if I push the envelope, and these things actually exist, and they can kill me, I'm taking a heck of a chance. What if they don't exist at all? Well, then I'm like, well, fine. Now I'm just going to go do this because what's it matter? They don't exist, right? So that's where I get into this whole sort of, I'm just going to do it and see what happens and hope they like me if they exist. Boy, this is really fogging up. I'm well, sorry, guys. I can't do much about this fog ring that's happening, but it's a director's commentary. So chill out. Todd finally arrived about 40 minutes behind me, and we proceeded to look at his new methods to try to catch DNA evidence of a species known as Gigantopithecus. It's fairly ingenious, too, using natural burrs glued to branches to catch hair for DNA testing. Again, how obsessed do you have to be that he climbed the mountain before this week or whatever before, or I, don't, I don't know when, and glued burrs to trees to catch hair samples of Sasquatch DNA. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say. All it takes is one. Oh, those are hairs, dude. There's still one in there. Look at that. Those are definitely hairs. Yeah, I can see it. Short. Very short, but... The collecting of DNA remains as one of the most controversial aspects of the phenomenon known as Sasquatch. On several occasions, DNA has been gathered and claimed by official university labs to be some kind of human-ape hybrid. Later, Todd would test this small bit of hair, and it turns out 
to be 95% human DNA. 5% unknown. Actually, yeah. And I'll just say that he did. If I remember correctly, he sent the hair in, and um, the university sent back the results, and uh, he showed me the paperwork on it. So you see, that's what happens. Is people are trying to do these DNA testings. And, um, but what do you do with that? How do you convince anybody of anything? And it's just, I don't know. It's one of those things where I suppose, as people always say, until there's a dead body laying there, they're just not going to believe it. So, I brought up a couple of the infrared uh, trail cams. So I'm going to set them up. Todd is feeling frustrated with the rest of the world's progress and accepting the existence of what he believes is Gigantopithecus. And this was before Todd then tried to, I don't know if he tried to sue the BC government or something like that, um, but he tried to take them to court to get Sasquatch listed uh, uh, on the endangered species list or something like that he did anyway. But it, it, it got thrown out because they're just not going to take that seriously. A bipedal ape. And so for the first time, he's allowing me to put out cameras and audio devices in an effort to collect evidence. These are combined with his usual methods of putting apples on a tree as gifts to entice something. The apples are stuck well onto the tree at about 15 and 7 foot reaches, with the hopes of ruling out sheep or bears unwilling to climb. With the bait firmly in place, we'll wait out the night, about 100 yards higher on the mountain. With stories ranging from friendship to even fatal abductions all pointing to Bigfoot, it's only my strong sense of skepticism and my comfort level in the wilderness that enables me to be out here at all. And what I mean by that is what I was just saying earlier. It's like, well, I mean, if they don't exist, what have I got to lose? You know, uh, well, your life, man, there's grizzlies out there. Now, I understand that, but I'm also really, really comfortable in the wilderness and really, really comfortable dealing with wildlife and animals, including bears. So on the it doesn't exist side of things, I'm good with whatever animals might be uh, curious of me uh, up there, including uh, grizzlies and, and, and cougars and black bears and what have you. I, I'll know how to deal with that. And if it does exist, well, I guess I'm trusting that they won't kill me. Most of what I expect to happen is nothing. Even that is an answer. What's becoming more and more difficult for me, as time and the research carries on, is determining exactly what answer it is I'm looking for. All right, so. Yeah, see, this was at that phase where I'm still trying to figure this stuff out, you know? I'm just like, this is getting weird, you know? And I think that's what was going on in my mind through, while filming this entire documentary series was, this is getting weird. And uh, I really need to get to the bottom of a few things and stop, and, well, not st stop, because I wasn't doing it to begin with, but just, avoid the uh, zealousness of various researchers who are so zoned in on it sort of thing. It's go, yeah, okay, well, yeah, but, you know, I want to know the truth behind it. Where's the proof? Where's the facts? I wanna, yeah. And, okay, it takes me going out there. Fine, I'll go out there and I'll experience it. My whole life's like that, so. I've got a couple of things set up for the night, just uh, really in, it's all in preparation of potential interaction with uh, something that a lot of people claim is called Sasquatch, Bigfoot. I've actually packed my stuff, my GPS satellite locator, I've got my knife and uh, bear bangers and things like that, and my boots are in my sleeping bag. And that harkens back to a story I heard of a trapper that was actually picked up sleeping bag and all and carried off and um, kidnapped by a family of Sasquatch. This happened in 1924, but he didn't tell his story really in full till many years later. And he even swore the story uh, before a judge as having been true. He was kidnapped and held for a couple of days uh, in a cave with a family of Sasquatch. But because there had been activity happening a couple of nights before that, that's what he did. He had stuff with him inside his bag, and he had also, um, he, well, actually his backpack got picked up, too. So the, so the Sasquatch picked up him and his backpack and carried him for two or three hours off into the wilderness. So, according to his story, me, I got all my stuff with me. Yeah, you do what you got to do.
last night was uneventful. So my first order of the day is to head 100 yards down the mountain. So last night was uneventful. And that's right. If I remember correctly, not much happened. Uh, but I believe we went down to look at the, uh, the apples. And see if anything took the apples that we stuck on the tree. Do you know what I'm doing right there? I'm breathing through my mouth. That's something I do if I get legitimately nervous in the wilderness and I think like there's a, there's a bear coming close or something like that. I start, I start breathing through my mouth. I don't know why I do that. I don't even know why I'm telling you that. But. I have to see this with my own eyes. It's because I was nervous when I saw this. Well, the, let me show you the disappointing part first. Camera fell Almost down. With only one of two alternatives. I never not noticed it. The camera fell down, but it doesn't. When I just saw that shot of it now, I realized you know, it doesn't look like it fell down. It looked like it was turned and then laying down. So I know that I didn't get any shots because of that. Either Todd is indeed a masterful, skillful hoaxer. Or something came in and took these apples, pushed over the camera, went up about 15 feet in the tree, and took all the apples. Huh. I don't know what to think anymore. So Todd slept about 75 yards away from me. Uh, is it possible that he got up in the middle of the night and went over to the tree, climbed the tree, and took the apples off, threw them away, climbed back down, went back to his thing, and slept? Yes, that's possible. Because at some point I did fall asleep. I was asleep. Uh, but it's not really probable. Because he was still close enough that if he'd gotten up and made all that kind of a ruckus, I would have likely heard him. But again, maybe he's an amazing hoaxer and he knew how to do that with such stealth that I didn't wake up. But he wouldn't have known whether or not I was sleeping. You know, he would have had to guess his less asleep kind of thing. I, um, and he would have had to not fall asleep himself, maybe set a little, a little alarm and go down and then get rid of those apples. But something took the apples overnight and something knocked the camera over. And I believe when we look at the footage, there's nothing of the camera even falling over. So... And I've got to spin my net out here alone. The camera's knocked over. If they didn't pick up that camera before they took these apples, yeah. there's no way they picked up that camera first. This is him being excited, thinking that he got, we got something on the camera when they went to get the apples. But again, he made a definitive statement. There's no way they picked up the camera first. They went, in other words, he's saying, they went for the apples first, it's going to be on the camera. But... It's like, hey, don't, don't make definitive statements of something you don't truly know. It, 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 it. I think you've got intense. Sasquatch footage on there. I don't know. I do. I feel it. See what I mean? I think we have Sasquatch footage on there. I know. I, I do. I feel it, right? Um, sorry, the card just died on this little camera. I've got to put another card in, uh, which I will do. So right now, I'm going to let this run. Well, I put another, ah, there we go. Put another card in. Oh, it's hot. Uh, okay, Luke, let it run. Now, I'm nervous. Todd is clearly excited. This is a man who's, who's had to put up with a lot of controversy over the years, a lot, of, a lot of claims of hoaxing and fraud. And I've had a lot of people say, look, he's frauding you, he's, he's hoaxing you. The hope, and I suppose Todd's dream, is that that camera got shots before it fell over. Honestly, this is the most significant experience I've had because the plausibility of Todd going down there and doing that is pretty low, to be honest with you. So, Todd will leave not too long from now. We'll get another apple up on that tree, put out some, some power bars, and then I'm here for the night alone, and we'll see what happens. 
I'll certainly be keeping my eyes and ears open. I don't think tonight's going to be a night I'm going to sleep a lot. The camera images proved nothing either way. It was likely knocked over by this little culprit, a pika, a kind of rodent. But knowing this doesn't answer the question of what took the apples 15 feet up the tree. After helping me put apples and chocolate bars back up in the tree, Todd will leave me alone on the mountaintop, which at the very least will rule out any chance of him hoaxing me if something happens tonight. When we first came on the site here, I met it here long before Todd did, and I found these depressions in the ground that are pretty hard to explain, uh, other than potentially grizzly bear, I think, but a very big grizzly bear at that. This track stood out. You can see the indentations in the ground here are very heavy. Now, it's potential that it was simply a rock that was here, and the rock eventually came out of the ground. This is a heavy, heavy stamp in the ground, and, you know, Maybe this is now where suggestion can be very powerful, but I can see the toe prints. And Todd came later and saw it, and he thought, of course, knowing Todd, he absolutely said, it's a Bigfoot print. And that's, that's the danger of being so absorbed in the subject matter. On the other hand, that's the benefit of being so absorbed in the subject matter. If you go out looking for grizzly, you'll find grizzly. If you go out looking for elk, you'll find elk. If you go out looking for Sasquatch, I still think we had some of the best music going. Ironically, the greatest argument is not between the skeptics and the believers. It's among the Bigfoot advocates themselves. No one could agree on what it is that we are all trying to find. Here in Radium Springs, British Columbia, Todd Stanning believes they are the long hidden offspring of a species of humanoid called Gigantopithecus. He may be right. And even though his own evidence is considered dubious and fake by many people, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because whether Todd is telling the truth or not, the fact remains, there are thousands of other people making the very same claim. I think that's my point all along often is, yeah, I, I know so-and-so might be uh, challenging. I know so-and-so, I don't know, you know, many people, different individuals in this might be uh, lying or faking or hoaxing, but I just don't like to throw the baby out with the bathwater because I don't like to limit my possibilities. You have to be of two minds out here. The job at hand, what is that? Filmmaker, documentarian. But I'm also a survival instructor. And I know how dangerous it is out here. And how one wrong step, one missed beat, could leave me in a very precarious situation. Just as it is when I'm out doing pure survival and I'm not on the hunt for Bigfoot. I've got to take real care. Make every step count. Monitor my food. I don't know if I'm going to even make it down off this mountain, so I've got to hold on to the food that I've got. It's very little. Just be careful with it. Same thing for the water. Most importantly, I've got to stay warm at night. If nothing happens out here tonight, that's what I'll say tomorrow morning. Nothing happened. I thought I was going to be saying that this morning. I truly thought I'd go down, see all those apples on the tree, and go, well, you know, Todd claims there's a couple of wood knocks. Sure, whatever. But instead, I went down and all those apples were gone. I can't explain that. Maybe a bird, but I haven't seen any ravens or any of the sort come around at all. Anything that has been here has been little songbirds and one gray jay. Not going to carry off those three apples. So what did? And so now, you know, I want to remind that when it comes to the uh, camera, that camera is really sensitive. I mean, it, it, dust would set off the trigger. And so, if I remember correctly, later we looked at the footage and it was just nothing. There was no footage. The camera was fine, didn't malfunction at all. Where's the footage? You know, if something 
knocked it over. And even if it was, uh, what do they call them, pikas, uh, um, you know, or a squirrel of sorts, uh, knocked it over. You, you get the tail and you get, you know, I've, I've caught so much wildlife on trail cams. There's always something, you know, the little claws, little things going on. And instead, it's knocked over and there's no footage of that. That's what's weird. And the apples are gone. And remember, I had to stand on his shoulders to get up to put the apple in where I did. Now, maybe he's an amazing climber and he just climbed up that tree and, and took the apples off. Uh, but I don't know. If the camera fell over before the apples were taken, then maybe an owl swooped in or an animal, a little creature squirrel did climb up and take the apples uh, because the camera's now fallen down. So this time I make sure the camera ain't gonna fall. What took the apples last night? What banged rocks together here last year? What has left suspicious looking tracks in hard packed ground? Maybe tonight, I'll find out. Uh, this is about halfway between where I am, where the apples are. You know, that black shirt has been with me for about 20 years and, and as many or more adventures. Thomas says, oh yeah, it's the same silly black shirt I wear wherever Whenever I go in the wilderness, now you get your favorites, right? What I've done is I've picked a sort of place of cover here and uh, put up my second camera. It should be filming me right now. For now, I've changed the card in the uh, camera that was on the apples, put up the apple, two power bars, move the camera a bit so it's secure now and it won't fall over, put a camera in here, both are running now. I'll come down later tonight, do a couple of hoops, maybe a wood knock, and I'll leave my audio recorder somewhere around here as well, just buried and hidden um, for sound. Oh yeah, and you know what? I forgot the audio recorder. So to this day, it's still up there. Uh, unfortunately, that's litter. I, I gotta go back at some point and pick it up. Uh, well, who knows what'll be on it? But uh, yeah, I did forget it, to get it the next day when I left, after everything that's about to happen happens. Maybe. That's understandable based on how the night turned out. And then, uh, and then I gotta, I gotta sit through the night on the top of this mountain. I'm here to get the right bit of footage that might blow the lid off of this phenomenon, or by my persistent search and coming up with nothing, proving more that there is nothing out here in the first place. All right, Apple's still in its place. Camera set up. Hopefully, will work. Audio recorder's in, turned on. Go back up and tend my fire. In this way, being alone at the top of the mountain, I become the bait. As the sun sets, it's always the, the most nervy part of any kind of time in the wilderness is as the sun's setting, because you know at that point, okay, now it's gonna get dark and everything changes in the dark. The whole idea about the fire is simple. Apparently, the Sasquatch feel more comfortable because they can see you and you can't really see them, so. Whenever I say apparently, it's because I've had so many conversations and that's what different people say to me, that they think they know, that they think they know. A lot of times, nice big fire, is when activity happens. People say, oh, something came around, it was standing on the edge in the darkness, and it came in close or whatever, and uh, oh, the, um, the fire seems to do the trick. I'm staying outside tonight just because I want to. I want to have a good clear view, but um, in other locations, I'll stay inside a tent and see how that works. As my night continues, things get weird. I see large, strange lights over a distant mountain hovering in the sky. If it was a jet, it would have been five times bigger than the Concorde. Four massive lights sat still and unmoving. By the time I set up my camera, they were gone. I shrugged it off and tried to get some sleep. Here's a weird thing about that. So yeah, this was the first time I had any experience whatsoever that you might want to say, oh, it was a UFO, you know. But I saw these massive lights in the sky and they weren't moving. It's kind of so big that you just wonder like, did, does everybody seeing this kind of thing? Although I was out in the middle of nowhere, but it seemed like they were so big that anybody from 
you know, a town that was 50, 70 miles away would still see them. And they were there for almost 20 minutes. So why didn't I film them? I'm a filmmaker. I'm a cameraman. I should have filmed them. Do you know what didn't occur to me? That's the weirdest thing. I just sat there watching them. And it never occurred to me to go and film them. It was really weird. Why wouldn't I? You know, I, I, what, wouldn't that be amazing to get that on, on camera? I, I, I mean, so putting some conjecture in there. I mean, it's like I was kind of hypnotized. It's too strong, but certainly I was just zoned out. Finally, when I went to go get the camera and I come back and they're gone. Strange, strange, strange. Maybe it's just an absolutely normal thing uh, that, um, you know, there's an explanation for it that's very in the real world. Uh, but I don't have it. All I know is I saw these big, huge, four round lights in the sky that were far away but massive. Who knows? Oh man, I just had the most insane dream. I fell asleep and the uh, fire got cold and I dreamt that <laughs> a Sasquatch came and was sitting on top of me and not letting me get up. And it became super vivid just for that moment, you know, in between dream and awake where you think it's real. I lit a big fire. So, to explain that, well, let me see if I explain it. We've all had vivid dreams, but this went beyond that. It felt like a big set of buttocks holding me down while my head was completely engulfed inside the mummy sleeping bag. I struggled to get my upper arm free and to pull my head out from the bag at this point wide awake and still feeling trapped. And the second I did get my face out of the bag, the feeling disappeared. Perhaps just a coincidental dream. I can't dispute that, but it sure didn't feel like one. The next morning, things get even stranger. So what I'm saying there is that I was lying on my left side and it felt like down around here, there was somebody, it'd be like, imagine like your big brother sitting on you, you can kind of feel buttocks sort of on you, holding you in. Now, I often sleep in my sleeping bag with it right over my head. It's just a quirky thing that I do. And uh, I think it goes back to my childhood. And so I was in the bag, right? And, and kind of like this and trapped. And my right arm was actually, like I couldn't bring my right arm up. And, it's, and I got more and more awake. So it went from dreamscape to lucid dream to I'm awake and I still can't move. When I finally wriggled myself so that I could do this with my sleeping bag, it was like this. It was like, and it was gone, right? It was just, I did that and the feeling left. All I'm doing right now is telling you a true story as far as my brain can remember it. I'm not even going to try to explain it because I can't. Oh boy. Well, everything's gone. The apple's gone. Power bars are gone. Yeah, now I had put uh, power bars up there as well. So there's apples and, you know, little travel power bars. All right, well, I'm gonna turn around and look at the camera. I hope it's still upright. And it is. Let's check the camera out. All right, everything's gone. Let's be clear here. The camera was well positioned and it's still upright. It's set to motion capture. It's dust would set it off. If anything went up that tree, a mouse or a squirrel, or if an owl came in, the odds of not getting it on that camera are, are uh, very slim. Okay, let's see how many clips we've got here. 
Nine clips. Huh. All right, so there's nine clips on this camera. And this time the apples were taken. The camera did not fall over. When I get below, we'll find out who the culprit is. <laughs> Yeah. Probably still to this day, craziest night I ever had out in the wilderness was that night. The lights, the feeling of being sat upon, waking up to find out that, that everything was taken uh, off the tree. Let's watch the, let's watch the footage. So let's establish the efficiency of the trail cams. They're motion triggered with about a half second delay, but they're very sensitive. Here are a series of shots from the base of the mountain where they were set off by something quickly going through the field of vision. Even dust particles will trigger it to record. Now for some reason, with nothing showing as having just run through the screen, here is a recorded image of the apple in its place throughout the night. In this first clip, I've highlighted the apple with a light circle. Now did you see that? The apple was well stuck on a branch, pointing up and away from the ground. So gravitational pull shouldn't have pulled it off. But in the second clip, it just disappears. It just vanishes, along with three chocolate bars I'd put on the other branches. And nothing was caught on film. No wind, nothing nudging it. The apple's there the apple's gone. You'd be hard pressed to convince me that it just fell off or a bird knocked it off and it all happened so quickly that the camera didn't catch it. No, something else happened. Let's look at the two clips again in real time. There's nothing to indicate what set off the camera into recording. Now there. Do you see that at the bottom? So, a uh, little story about this. That's the sound of the end of the GoPro that was over there filming me for the other angle. So let's just leave that off for now. Just me and you over here. Damn you, GoPro. Uh, actually, GoPro battery. Okay, so where was I? Um, uh, where the heck was I? Uh. What was that? Oh, Let's yes. Let's watch it again in real time. Okay, more. watch this. And this time, watch then the I'll tell you. On the middle tree, then the bottom left of the screen. Now here it is blown up in real time. And here it is in slow motion. Now let's freeze frame on the culprit. What? is that. Whatever it is, it has to be big enough to make a large tree shake. But here's the real rub. That spot where you see it pop up is at least six feet high off the ground. Right. See what I'm saying? And the thing about it is, I never saw that little thing in the bottom of the screen which conjecture has been that it, it looks kind of like the cone head of a large ape. Uh-huh, that's what I'm saying. I never saw that. And one day, uh, when the edit's being done on this show, I believe it was Graham, uh, one of my editors, who, who said, oh, Les, what do you want to do about, you know, that little, that little thing that bumped, you know, bumped into the screen there, you know, or sh showed up on the screen. And I went, well, what are you talking about? What little thing? Because, I mean, I looked at this on the card, but I never really noticed. We were just looking down on a little laptop kind of thing. It was, you know, the, the, the head that popped. What head that popped up? Come here and look. So I went and looked, and that's when we saw that. So it was like seven, eight months later that he showed me this. And I knew that the apple had disappeared, but that he showed me that that tree shook. And it's, you can see it's a substantial tree. And a little thing, in fact, if I'm looking at you right now, you can see it just comes, comes up like that, right? Just like that, just like my knuckles are doing. And similar shape too, right? 
And man, we were all like, whoa! We're in the edit suite going, oh man, what is that, right? So I thought, well, we have to, we have to show this in the show. And uh, let's see where else this goes. I think this is the end. The skeptic would say the apple somehow simply fell off its perch, even though it was well stuck onto a branch. And it triggered the camera, but fell out of view. Once on the ground, something came and took every last piece of it. The missing chocolate bars, well, we'll have to ignore that for now. The creature at the bottom left of the screen was either sheep on its hind legs, the top of a grizzly bear who has no ears, and left me alone just a hundred yards away while I slept. My dream of being sat on was just a coincidental dream. The lights in the sky, a very large jet. The advocates would say it's Bigfoot. All right, and that's where we'll leave it. So, that night on the mountain, I'll never forget it as long as I live, because I have things that happen there that I, as, you, as you've heard now, heard that I just can't really explain. Uh, and I, I challenge you to try to explain it to me. Uh, and I think you'd probably potentially come up with some stuff that already has answers. Like, no, that's not the case, or no, that's not the case, is what I'd probably say. Uh, and, uh, but I think that night on the mountain changed me. It made me think there's something else going on here, and I need to dig in deeper. And it was all because of going up there that night and staying up there by myself and experiencing these weird things. I mean, it was kind of a, you know, um, triple play there, right? The, uh, the, the lights in the sky, the, the strange feeling of being sat on, and then everything disappearing. And then only to find out seven months later that there's also a little tiny image caught on that camera. Uh, just kind of put me in a different place saying, okay, I got to... I remember thinking, okay, I have to rethink what, what I'm doing here and how I'm trying to research this phenomenon. So it was a very important film in the series of uh, Survivor Man Bigfoot. And uh, thanks for joining me again for another director's commentary. I will, uh, I will see you for another one soon. <laughs>